Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel and to some more urban legends that come under scary. That's the category they come under. I'm not saying you'll be afraid of them, but that's just the category. The first story is clowning around. A couple went out for a dinner date one night and left their children with a new babysitter. The mother was a little unsure about her as she was quite young and the children hadn't been sleeping well lately after scaring each other with stories about a boogeyman hiding in their bedrooms. She wanted to ring and check how things were going at home, but the father reassured her that it was better not to interfere. Just then, the mother's mobile phone rang and it was the babysitter, who said that there was no problem, the kids were fine, but the clown was creeping them all out. Would it be okay if she moved it? What clown? the mother asked. That weird clown figure that's standing in the corner of the living room, the sitter explained. The mother told her to grab the children, go next door immediately, and call her as soon as they got there. The babysitter replied, Okay, but why? There's nothing to worry about. The mother replied, There is something to worry about. We don't have a clown statue. The next story is, don't look behind you. A young woman was driving home in a new SUV one night from a 24-hour supermarket. The high driving position made her feel safer on the road after a last car, a hatchback, was written off in an accident with a truck. A few minutes after she had pulled onto the main road, she noticed bright lights in her rearview mirror. She paid no attention to them, as they continued to dazzle her. The large truck behind her was flashing his lights. She decided to ignore the driver and accelerated away from him. It wasn't safe to stop and she wasn't far from home, in the suburbs, where her boyfriend would be waiting. Then the truck loomed in her mirror again and she could see the driver trying to get her to pull over. She was worried he was going to ram her off the road. But as soon as she reached her junction and pulled off the main road. To her horror, however, she saw that the truck was still following her. So, she put her foot down and screeched to a halt outside her house, running for the door. The truck driver pulled up somewhere behind her, lowered his window and yelled, Get in your house, lock the door. She turned around in surprise as her boyfriend opened the door and saw in the truck's headlights a man roll out from underneath her car and run off down the road. When he had gone, the truck driver got out of his cab and approached her, explaining why he had been following her since she had left the supermarket. That guy has been hanging underneath your car all the way here, and I think he has a knife. The next is Black Eyed Teens. This story first appeared in the early days of the internet, posted on a message board. A young professional in the Midwestern American town had gone to pick up some supplies from a late night convenience store. After leaving the shop, he got in his car and prepared to drive off, when he heard the knock at the window. Standing there were two small boys, both quite young and wearing hoods. He wound the window down to see what they wanted and instantly felt that something was not quite right with these children who were asking him where he lived. He wasn't really scared, but for some reason he lied and said that he lived on the opposite side of town. They told him that was where they lived as well, and then he had lived home because they had missed their bus. At that point it was past 10pm, and the man was aware that the buses just stopped running a few hours previously. What were they doing out at this time on their own? The boys asked if he was going to let them in, saying that they were getting hungry, and one of them put his hand on the door handle, which the man quickly locked from inside. The taller of the pair said that they were only kids, insisting, we're not going to do anything bad, but we can't get in the car unless you ask us. This kind of talk alarmed the driver. He started the car, but they knocked again and he wondered whether leaving the kids of that age alone in the dark would be the right thing to do. Then he noticed their eyes. 
Their eyeballs were totally black, with no visible iris, as if they were full of jet black ink. You need to let us in. We can't come in unless you ask us. You can't leave us out here, they repeated. He ignored them and sped off. And as he looked back in the mirrors, he saw that they had disappeared. Shaken by the incident, he posted a description on a local message board. It wasn't long before his story was picked up nationwide. Several other sightings were reported up and down the country, all of them involving young children knocking on doors and windows of cars and houses, asking to be let in for food, and becoming quietly insistent when they were denied access. Nobody knows what would happen if you beckoned them inside, because the only people who did were sadly unable to tell the tale. The next story is called Home Alone. British newspapers reported the mysterious case of a girl who was spending the day at home alone after her school was closed due to a snowstorm. She was watching TV in the living room where she noticed something out of the corner of her eye. In the glass doors that led out into the garden, there was a man standing in the bushes, staring directly at her. She screamed and immediately sprang off the sofa, ran out of the room to call the police. When she got through, she told them there was an intruder in her garden, and the operator told her to make sure all the doors and windows were locked. Officers were on their way, but would be delayed by the snow on the roads. She was terrified. She couldn't remember whether the patio doors were locked or not, and it took all the courage she could muster to tiptoe back into the living room and check if the man was still in the garden. She couldn't see him. She quickly locked the doors. She endured an agonising wait by the front door until two policemen arrived. They told her that they were already searching for a dangerous suspect responsible for an assault in another home in the area and went outside to check the garden. To their confusion, they found that there were no footprints despite the thick snow covering the grass. When they returned to the living room, they saw what they were looking for a set of wet footprints behind the sofa. You were very lucky, young lady. He was standing right behind you. What you saw was his reflection in the glass. Holy crap. He hadn't actually been outside. He was inside behind her all that time. <gasps> no. The next story is The Crying Baby. A woman was working late at her office in the city when she was interrupted by a strange noise coming from outside a window. As it got louder, she recognised the unmistakable sound of a crying baby. An unusual noise at this time of night in that part of town, where there were few houses. She looked out of the window and couldn't see anything, but the crying continued, and it sounded almost as if it were actually inside the building. She checked downstairs, where the noise was so loud, that it could only have been coming from the right, on the outside of the front door. She put her hand on the door handle, but despite all her instincts telling her to help the baby, something stopped her from opening it. Instead, she called the police and described the situation, asking them if they knew anything about a missing baby. She didn't get the answer she expected, as the police officer told her not to open the door under any circumstances, to move away from the windows and wait for help to arrive. The woman took this to mean that a missing child had indeed been reported, and she put the phone down. She moved away from the windows and waited, but the crying continued to get louder, and she began to wonder why she should wait for the police. After all, they could take hours to arrive and the bib might need urgent medical attention. It must have been getting cold out there. She decided that she would wait, but then decided she would bring the poor child inside. Then she would wait for the police. So she opened the door and stepped out onto the street. The crying stopped. But she could see no signs of a baby. The next sound she heard were her own screams. When the police finally arrived, they found her lifeless body on the street, her throat slashed. If she had stayed on the phone long enough, the police officer would have had time to explain that there was a serial killer on the loose in the town who was luring women outside at night with the recorded sound of a crying baby. There is also a film out regarding this urban legend. I've watched it. Um, it's interesting and it has a really bizarre twist. Mm. It's good though. 
The next is Don't Play the Lottery. The police department of a small town in Australia put out an online message warning residents about the unknown man who was suspected of killing one homeowner, seriously wounding another and trespassing on several other people's properties. He was dubbed the lottery killer because of his particular method of approaching his targets and murdering them. The first thing the victim would notice was a figure with his face obscured, standing somewhere he could clearly be seen. Late at night, he would pick houses with glass doors or large windows overlooking the street, which he was standing in front of, silhouetted against the street lights, waiting to be noticed by the occupants, sometimes for several hours. Then he would knock 13 times at the door and wait for a response. If spoken to, he wouldn't respond, but if the door was opened, he would attack viciously and indiscriminately with a long knife murdering people in their own home. A bloody lottery ticket was left on their bodies. The next is the Goebbels Vampire. The children waited until it was dark to sneak out of their homes, picking up sticks and rocks to use as weapons on their way to the cemetery. They stalked the gravestones all night, waiting for a sight of what they had come to flush out, the Goebbels Vampire. The Gobbles area of Glasgow, Scotland, had been terrorised by stories of a seven-foot-tall vampire with metal teeth who preyed on children and had already eaten two local boys. The rumours were so powerful that gangs of hysterical kids took the cemetery in the south of the city to catch the monster, despite efforts by the police to stop them. Frightened parents pestered the authorities, wanting to know if there really was a child-eating, blood-sucking murderer roaming the place. To alleviate their fears, the authorities blamed the new comics from America, which were full of horror stories, for whipping, whipping up some wild ideas in young minds, and even went as far as banning sensationalist publications. However, the local children suspected that the adults were lying and were also terrified of the iron-fanged fiend. They were sure that he wasn't some imagined monster from a comic book. The vampire was real, and they were going to find him. The sprawling Victorian cemetery looked like the perfect lair for an undead creature of the night. Home to most than a quarter of a million dead bodies, its crumbling statues and sunken gravestones were lit at night by the flames of a nearby steelworks. The children scrambled over a seven-foot wall and dropped down amongst the graves, speaking in whispers. Then someone shouted, There he is! As a shadow flashed quickly across the tomb, the children gave frantic chase, tumbling over headstones in the dark and brandishing makeshift weapons. Soon, they came upon a great stone mausoleum, its door ajar. Peering into the murky depths of the tomb, they could make out a large stone coffin in the corner with its heavy marble lid pushed to one side. Was this the beast's hiding place? A couple of the braver kids, egged on by the others, edged inside the building and fearfully poked their sticks inside the dark tomb. The rest of the gang held their breath, unsure whether they would stay and fight or run for their lives if the creature was awoken. But no attack came. The tomb was empty. Clearly the vampire had escaped their grasp once more, but his hunters vowed to return the next night, and the next, if necessary, armed with wooden stakes. Yeah, vampires were a big thing back in the day. Um, like we heard earlier, I told the one in, um, in London Cemetery. Um, yeah, they were a really big thing back in the day for some reason. The Bunny Man is the next one. There is a tunnel under a road that runs through remote woods in Oregon. An insane asylum had been built in the vicinity not long after the Civil War. As the area was colonised and became more popular, houses were built around the asylum and near the turn of the century, the residents started to question its existence. When an escaped patient attacked a child, the authorities finally decided to close the institution. They loaded the patients onto buses to transfer them to alternative places, but one of the vehicles crashed in the woods after a violent passenger broke free of his chains and attacked the driver. All were later apprehended, except for two, Billy Smith and Michael Wood, Police and dogs combed the forest, picked up a trail marked with the mutilated bodies of rabbits, some half-eaten. 
The trail led down to an old wagon truck to the bridge, where they found one of the missing patients. Michael Wood was hanging inside the tunnel. He had been bludgeoned to death and his ears had been removed. Attached to his front was a note that read, You'll never catch the bunny man. The attribute of the murder to Billy Smith, supposedly a friend of Wood, and convicted of several violent crimes against animals. The search continued, but Billy, or Bunny Man, as the cops had taken to calling him, was never found. The only traces he possibly left behind were the rabbits nailed to trees that hunters would occasionally find on overgrown paths, which they put down to a macabre joke. Although Billy Smith was eventually forgotten, the story of the Bunny Man was passed down through generations of locals, and the tunnel became the place to be for bored teenagers who would dare themselves to stay there until midnight. In 1965, a group of teas had congregated at the bridge on Halloween. Seven remained until midnight, but one of the girls decided to walk home just before then, and she wandered away, back down to the track to the main road. A moment later, she looked back and saw a bright flash of light coming from under the bridge even though there were no cars or people on the road. Then she heard her friends screaming at the top of their lungs. Soon there was nothing but silence and darkness. Terrified, she ran home. The next day, all of the teens who had remained under the bridge at midnight were discovered hanged, with their ears cut off. The police found a dismembered rabbit nailed to a tree nearby, along with a note that read, Don't forget the bunny man. They never managed to identify the suspect, never mind the murderer. Years later, a teenager and his girlfriend had driven down there in search of some privacy. If you pulled off the main road and down an old track, nobody could see your car under the bridge. They both knew the legends. They had heard them since kindergarten, but nobody was scared of them anymore. It was a bright summer night with a full moon, and the place was indeed full of rabbits, which stepped in front of the car's headlights, which would stop them, and obviously they would stare as the pair drove under the bridge. The pair soon lost track of time, and at midnight they didn't notice the rabbits screaming under the bridge, as if running from a predator. They only looked up when they saw a flash of light. The next person who saw them was a man searching for his dog that had run off to chase the local rabbits. The teens were swinging from the roof of the bridge, their ears missing. As the pet owner stared in shock at the grisly sight, the dog brought him a piece of paper in his mouth, and it said, You'll never catch the bunny man. Jeesh, that's freaking horrible. The next is the massacre, and this is in 2007. On a, this was um, in a Ohio newspaper. It reported rumours um, buzzing around local university campus. A famous psychic had appeared on a phone in radio show claiming to have heard predictions at a seance. She warned that a massacre would take place at the college on Halloween and that by the end of the month, seven students would die in a large H-shaped building near a railroad track on a Ohio campus. Students made frantic phone calls to university administrators, who in turn called the police to investigate the claims, but were reassured that there was no substance to the rumours. Nonetheless, extra officers were deployed to help the regular campus cops. The student paper reported that some students were genuinely in fear of an attack, and many had taken refuge off campus until the threat was over. Soon it was the last weekend of the month, and the College Drinking Society was due to hold a party. To show that they weren't scared by the rumours, they decided that it would have a serial killer theme. Students who had not taken flight turned up wearing costumes from horror movies, and the venue was deliberately chosen because it was located in a H-shaped building. Halfway through the party, there was a blackout, and the drunken students joked that it would be a perfect time for the psychic's attacker to strike. When the lights came back on, though, nobody was laughing. Seven students lay dead, killed with an axe to the head in the bathroom. The next one is a very well-known urban legend. 
and if you hear any snoring in the background, it's just Storm, by the way. She's real loud. Anyway, it's called Where's My Liver? Bobby had been told by his mother to go to the shops and pick up a packet of fresh liver from the butchers. His grandfather was coming for dinner, and liver and onions was his favourite dish. Bobby hated liver, and he hated going to the butchers, but he did as he was told and set off to the shops. On the way there, he met a friend, who invited him to play a new computer game at his house, with some other mates. Bobby wanted to explain that he was running an errand for his mother, but he was too embarrassed, so he accepted. After all, it wouldn't take long. When he next checked the time, he realised it was dark, and all the shops would probably be shut. He shot off out the house and ran down the road to the butcher's, which was indeed closed. He was wondering what he would say to his mother when he saw an old man rummaging around in the bins to the rear of the shop. He looked like a tramp, greasy hair, plastered over his dirty skin. Next to him was a supermarket trolley filled with filthy bags. The man saw him, and though Bobby wanted to run away, he was curious, so he asked the man what he was looking for. I've been getting myself some meat, he told the boy, evidently pleased with himself. They throw out perfectly good stuff here every day, he added, pointing at the bins. Bobby saw that he had filled his trolley with lumps of meat wrapped in paper, and on the top was a fat calf's liver. Before the old man could react, he grabbed it and ran off home as fast as he could. All the way down the high street, Bobby could hear the trolley squeaking after him, but there was no way such an old man could keep up with a young boy. The liver went down a treat, and Bobby's grandfather said it was the best he'd eaten for as long as he could remember. The boy was allowed to stay up late that night as a reward, and he played computer games downstairs until the small hours, pleased with his actions. As he was walking upstairs to bed, he heard a noise outside the front door, so he looked out of the window, but there was nothing there. Then came a squeaking sound, unmistakably the noise of an old supermarket trolley. Still, he could see nothing. But the noise grew louder, and when the trolley came into view, Bobby ran upstairs in terror and hid under the blankets. He didn't dare look out of the window to see if the old man was there. And eventually, he fell asleep. He was woken later by a knock on his bedroom door, followed by silence. A voice hissed, Where's my liver? Then again louder. Where's my liver boy? Bobby was frozen on the spot, and although he tried to scream, no noise came out. The door handle turned, and the old man from the butcher stood in the doorway, smiling in the darkness. He was flashing a meat cleaver. There's my liver. <laughs> the next story is called The Bridge. There is a bridge in Wales where thrill-seeking teenagers go on Halloween. It's a pretty little humpback stone bridge, spanning a rocky river that flows down from the mountains, but it has a sinister past. Many years ago, there was a young woman, an only child, who lived in the manor house up the valley. She was smart and headstrong, and refused to marry the men that her father found for her. So, he kept her locked away waiting for her to agree to do his bidding. One day, a relative visited in a brand new motor car, a rare machine of the time in that part of the country. Her father had let his daughter out of her room for the occasion, so she took her opportunity to escape. When her father wasn't looking, the girl leapt into the driver's seat and sped off down the valley. She flew down the hill towards the river, enjoying the blissful minute of freedom. Before she realised that she didn't know how to stop the vehicle, and she ploughed straight off the bridge onto the rocks below. Now many years later, it's still said that she haunts that bridge. If you flash your headlights as you're driving over it, your car will stall. If you're lucky, it will start again in a few moments. You can be on your way. But if you're not, you will hear the girl knocking on the window. If you don't open a door to let the girl in, you will die in a car accident within a week. The girl never managed to escape over the bridge, and she won't let you escape either. And those are the rest of the urban legends that come under scare stories. I don't think they're that scary, they're just a bit creepy maybe, and quite inter interesting, but anyway, many blessings. <laughs>